So this, this presentation I'm about to give is uh, a presentation I originally gave at the Gates Foundation a few years ago, and it's been um, evolving over time as, as uh, my and our work in networks has been evolving. Um, and so the title of this is Life in Networks, um, which is both meant to uh, take a peek inside networks, which we all know, we all know very well because we literally survive by virtue of the fact that we are a part of networks, but also to make the point that there's considerable life in networks and where we are not sufficiently connected and where there are not sufficient flows, that has a lot to say about the lack of life, the lack of liveliness, the lack of wealth, the lack of health, the lack of education, the lack of justice. So those are all topics I want to get into as we get deeper into this topic of, of networks. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, let's see if this will work, just introduce quickly my organization, the Interaction Institute for Social Change. We are a 25-year-old nonprofit capacity building organization based in Boston, but we work globally. Um, our mission over time has changed a little bit here and there in terms of the actual wording, but really it comes down to this uh, mission, this goal of uh, skilling up and supporting the will of a diverse public to create and sustain social justice and sustainability. Uh, and then while I'm here alone, I am I'm not alone. I uh, represent this beautiful community of practitioners, both staff members of the Interaction Institute, as well as affiliates around the country and uh, around the globe. So uh, very much a we, not just a me in this case. So they are my colleagues. And then as we pivot to getting into this content around networks, one of the things that we do at the Institute as we help build collaborative capacity through our training, through our facilitation, through our coaching and consulting is we uphold this collaborative change lens, which is really making explicit our commitment to progressive social change. I'm saying that when we are uh, working to build change and do it collaboratively, it's important to look at these facets of power. Uh, power not being anything that's uh, neutral. It can be, well, I'm, I'm sorry, it can, it's, it's neutral, but it can be used for the ends of good, and it certainly can be used for the ends of, of ill. Uh, and our intent at ISC is to leverage power to build, uh, to create equity and ensure inclusion. Um, Skipping down to the bottom here, uh, we also are all about harnessing love as a force for social transform transformation. Love, while it can be uh, sound like a squishy word, we're finding, especially in these times of, of fracture and dissolution and uncertainty, that standing in a space with a fierce conviction to one another's humanity, to telling truth, and doing that with love, and looking at the best in people, um, Brian Stevenson once said he thinks that you know we are all better than the worst thing that we've ever done. Uh, so it's in that spirit that we embrace love as a force for social change. And then really looking at networks as the fundamental unit of change, not just individuals, not organizations, but much more vastly interconnected organisms that are what make change happen. So I wanted to get into this topic of networks by telling a story. Uh, I found that Telling stories as opposed to jumping into theory makes this much more accessible. And I thought I'd begin of the many different stories I'd like to pull from one about philanthropy, since it will be something you all can certainly relate to given your work. And so this begins with the Barr Foundation, which is the largest funder in the state of Massachusetts based in Boston. Uh, they fund the spaces of education and climate and the arts. And this story goes back a few years when uh, one of the senior program officers was taking a look at her portfolio of grantees, and actually these were two separate portfolios. Um, she was looking at the portfolio of grantees de dedicated to green buildings. So those grantees were interested in climate change and looking at how uh, buildings were generating emissions. Uh, but then also looking at this other grantee portfolio of advocates for healthy buildings. So people who are looking at issues of asthma or toxic runoff into waterways or air pollution. And while looking at these two portfolios and realizing that neither one was really having the successes that she wanted them to have, she began to ask the question, why are these separate portfolios? Um, they're centered around some different issues, but was wondering <coughs> what might happen if we started to bring these grantees together. So she and, at the time, uh, their chief knowledge officer, Roberto Cremonini, 
and listed uh, a, a facilitator, one of my colleagues, and a network mapper. And he said, why don't we get these grantees together? And when they come together, we want to begin to explore what some of the common ground might be uh, uh, for these different organizations, and to do that through network mapping initially. So in advance of the convening, what they did is they created a map based on who the different um, organizations were and how well they knew each other and how much they were working with one another. And so the slide that's up now is the map that was shown in that convening. Uh, and if we were in person, I'd do much more sort of uh, Q&A with you all in terms of what you see in this map. Uh, but typically what people will say is they see that there are uh, this, this sort of separation of, of camps, the red dots being the healthy building nodes and then the green dots being the green building nodes. You have then the yellow dot, which is the funder of the Bar Foundation, and a few blue dots, which are state government agencies. And so you see the separation of camps, you see them completely isolated dots or nodes. Um, those organizations that are not really tied to any other organizations yet working in this space. Uh, and then you see the whole thing more or less being held together by the funder itself. And so this becomes somewhat of a precarious network because it's all kind of hinged on one robustly connected funder and one robustly connected um, nonprofit. So when this was shown in the room, uh, this was not news necessarily to anybody. But there's something about the visual of when you actually start to map that helps light bulbs go off in people's heads. As they looked at this picture, they became really interested in exploring what it would mean if this looked different. What would it mean if we were more robustly connected? What would it mean if this whole thing didn't hang on just a few central nodes? So that inquiry led to additional mapping of various kinds, uh, not in terms of network mapping, but asset mapping, strategy mapping, where these groups were starting to look at where they had overlap in terms of um, strategies, in terms of audiences, in terms of partnerships, and then also beginning to look at where there were glaring gaps, where nobody was speaking to a certain segment, uh, to a stakeholder group, et cetera. And this, began to even further people's interest in, in thinking about these gaps, these overlap, overlaps, helpful redundancies, um, and where nobody was uh, taking action. And through this uh, network mapping and actually through technical analysis, what they came up with was, for example, one exercise where they determined the top 10 pairs of people in the network who should do lunch with one another. And this was done not just for those individuals to have a nice meal together, but this was done in the name of strengthening the overall network. If you've got people in different places, different nodes connected, what might that facilitate for the whole? Uh, getting new relationships up and running, getting new resources moving in the overall network. And so this continued over time. The group uh, voluntarily continued to meet, the foundation continued to pull them together, and two years later, they did another network map. So this is the 2005 map, and then this is the 2007 map, two years later. So again, if we had more time and we were in person, I would ask you, what, would, what do you see as the difference between these two maps? And often what people will say is the difference between 2005 and 2007 is 2007 is much more robustly connected. Uh, you see the camps much less isolated from one another. You see certain nodes that are becoming hubs, that is, that they have many more connections. You see no isolated nodes at this point. There are some that are still a bit peripheral, but everybody is connected to somebody else in the network. And so this makes a pretty picture, um, and actually I will ask this question if we can, Sarah, maybe right now. Why? Why does this picture, other than maybe perhaps looking like a more a pretty prettier picture, why does this matter? The second map, what what what, what might this suggest is happening? So anybody wants to That's jump an in? Open question. I just muted everyone, so you'll just have to unmute yourself in order to speak, or raise your hand, and I can unmute you. <laughs> 
Curtis uh, and yeah. James, James here from James Static. If, yeah. if, yeah. if I could just say that it's, it's the period between two thousand five and seven. seven. And that is after you have the initiative of the top ten people who should lunch together. Yes, um, yes. This is as a result of it. So clearly, it, it suggests that it's very much uh, a thing around personal, personal contact strengthening uh, the the relationships there. Um, yes. And I think this it just makes for creating a, a much more dense and connected network as a result. Once when when people see it as a personal relationship rather than a purely organisational one. Mm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that was really what did start to manifest over time is that people began to get out of just their pure roles and within their organizational context and started reaching out, um, having more of these interpersonal connections. Uh, and again, what that began to facilitate were impacts for this network and some of their organizational missions. So if we go to the next slide here, you'll see that um, over time, this is written up in a case study that I can send to you all, uh, that there was a deepening of relationships and along with that an expanding knowledge of one another's work. And so that greater understanding and awareness of one another's work led to greater alignment, realizing, oh, you're interested in that as well. Um, and uh, also more robust coordination of advocacy work. So rather than one camp going to the mayor's office, both camps went together and enlisted their friends. And with that louder voice, they had greater access to city decision makers. And over time, what that led to was an integration of the network objectives into city projects, into permitting, into building codes, into siting of facilities. Uh, and because to be clear, there was a justice, a big justice component to this in terms of where things were built, with um, you know what kinds of uh, intent, code, legalities. And beyond all of that, um, getting back to James's point, as people were really getting to know one another more deeply, these emergent opportunities and emergent collaborations began to surface. People began to go in on grants together. They began to start new ventures together, not the entire network necessarily, but twos and threes and fours going off. Um, and so what you began to see is this much more robust ecosystem of not just relationship, but activity of exchange, of awareness, of understanding, of advocacy, and of real wins. Uh, so it's one of the, for me, best kind of contained examples of why supporting more robust connectivity matters, because it can actually lead to these other things. Not always, because there actually have to be other components that we'll, we'll talk about shortly. Uh, but uh, this, this shows why connectivity in networks matters. So rather than pausing right now, I'm going to go ahead and move on and just say a little bit more about networks, what they are, and why networks says we should um, care about them. So networks are all around us. A very basic definition of networks is that they are nodes and links. They are elements that are connected, and those elements could be people, they could be schools, other kinds of organizations, they could be termination, uh, 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 train uh, uh, stations, they could be computer terminals. Um, the idea, though, is that they are connected in some larger pattern by different types of connectivity, common values, ideas, friends, acquaintances, likes, roads, um, cables. And that through that larger pattern of connection, something can happen that wouldn't happen if those elements were more in isolation from one another. So again, those networks could be in-person networks, they could be virtual networks, or they could be some kind of combination of in-person and virtual. But the idea is that the network becomes something much greater in capacity. So network science says that some of the capacities that show up when networks begin to form are adaptive capacity, which means when you have a much more robustly connected group of organizations of people that are not just centrally held by a single organization, but are more distributed, you have more adaptive capacity that the network can absorb shocks and it can respond in turn, adapt with a different kind of strategy. Uh, there's some great stories coming out of Hurricane Sandy, which was a traumatic event in this country, where uh, Occupy Sandy, uh, which was a grassroots-led organization, 
uh, was able to respond in much more timely ways uh, and in quicker ways than, say, FEMA was on the ground. Another example of a network effect is small world reach. They used to say that it was six degrees of uh, separation. Now we talk about more maybe, more, maybe like two and a half degrees of separation. We can reach people, and your network is a great example of that, around the globe much more quickly. Uh, so globally, we can take action. Nationally, we can take action. And we can reach out over all kinds of boundaries, temporal, geographic, cultural. And that can uh, have all uh, different kinds of benefits including um, creativity when you're reaching across different kinds of, of boundaries, innovation. Rapid dissemination is another network effect when you can get something out very quickly. You see how things go out on Twitter very quickly, various kinds of hashtags when people are, are so much more connected and things are moving much more quickly. And then resilience, which is largely related to adaptive capacity as well. Again, assuming that a network is not singularly held by a central node when it is more um, more diffuse and more distributed, it can it can absorb a shock. Maybe one node can go away, and that network can continue to be resilient. And this has uh, a lot to do with what we see in communities, in actual local communities that are resilient. There's a whole kind of network science to why communities um, can be more resilient, some more so than others. And for me, another just uh, exciting part of network science is not just the social network analysis, but what's called flow network science, which is basically saying the connections we have are only as good as what's moving between them, moving through those connections. So one of my uh, colleagues and mentors, Dr. Sally Gurner, who looks at flow network science, has said that long-term prosperity is primarily a function of these healthy human webs that are characterized by diversity, characterized by intricacy, meaning many different connections, and also characterized by a robustness of flow. And when Sally uses the word prosperity, she is talking about wealth, but she's also talking about health. She's talking about learnedness. She's talking about justice. She's talking about health. So there's a whole network science around flow and exchange that has a lot to say about why systems are strong or brittle. And when we've done uh, evaluations of networks at the individual level, um, individuals such as yourselves who are part of a, of a network, whether it's an action network or learning network, we ask people about the value they derive from being part of those, that, that network or those networks. They will often say some combination of these things, being around people who inspire and support, literally a support network, new kinds of learning when you're able to reach out beyond your usual sphere, uh, just a broader sort of pool of learning that you can access. Uh, that inc can include getting updates from people on this fuller picture of what's going on in, in, your, in your shared context, the tools, skills. Many people will, uh, will say, and especially smaller organizations, this idea of being part of something much bigger um, that can amplify their voice and their efforts, but also give them the sense of prestige and recognition. Uh, and where there is a, an ethic of generosity and sharing, there is also an access to new funding and other kinds of resources, new partnerships, joint projects, and activities. So I, I point out all of this to say that there's a tremendous promise to taking a network approach and also stepping into a network mindset. It certainly doesn't manifest in every situation, but the science shows that all of this can happen if we're intentional and aware in certain kinds of ways. Um, I wanted to move from here into this question of how do we maximize value and impact in networks and our networked activity, because this doesn't just happen on its own, but wanted to pause to see at this point if there are any questions or comments. Sarah, if you could unmute people just, or they can raise their hand. Yes, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone next to your name or raise your hand and I can unmute you. Give it another 10 seconds. 
<laughs> you can also type um, in the, the box below in the chat box if you're shy or cannot access your audio. Nothing now? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so back into the, uh, the presentation. So I wanted to take um, uh, to, to look at how we can maximize value and impact in networks and kind of do it through seven different perspectives. Um, so one perspective uh, relates to thinking about the kind of network we are trying to create and manifest. So this comes from the work of Pete Plastrick and Madeline Taylor, who wrote a book. Actually, this was from their paper, Net Gains, a number of years ago where they talked about a typology of different kinds of social change networks, making the point that there are different ways of creating value towards change. And one is just to create greater connectivity. There are some networks which are just really grounded in that through learning, through exchange. They are building stronger connections and trust. They're sharing knowledge, creating new knowledge. They're developing more robust understanding of systems of what one another is doing, and that in and of itself can create value, um, can create impact. There are other networks that may want to build upon that connectivity to say, well, we want to actually align around something, and this is not uncommon for the network that I've worked with over the last dozen years, where they'll say, you know, we have something here. We have deep trust. We have some commonalities. What if we were to, to, to begin to align around some kind of common value proposition, whether that be a shared vision, a shared mission, shared values, creating some kind of um, proclamation? Um, and so there are networks that are just about trying to get to that point of aligning around some kind of common proposition without necessarily getting into coordinated action, which is another modality of change networks that want to get into campaigns and advocacy. They want to get into prototyping different kinds of new ventures and projects, raising new resources and funds. That, is, that sometimes is the first inclination of a network, which is to say, we got to get to action. Um, but sometimes it's just enough to create that connectivity and to move organically from there. So one way of creating impact and creating value is just to ask yourself what kind of network or to have members of a network say, what kind of network do we want to be? What will support us where we are in terms of creating something that will you know, benefit all of us in the field in which we're working? So that's one way of thinking about impact and value. A second way of thinking about how to maximize impact and value is to think about the structure you have for a network. So these are three very simplified structures uh, and many networks will have something much more um, complex than what appears on the screen. But I've worked with networks, for example, that are fairly centralized where you have a central node that pulls the whole thing together and that's often the first step uh, that's taken to bring a network together. You may have disparate actors and somebody steps in and says, let's pull the field together. Let's convene people and see what we have. Um, and so that can be a great and important step to begin to create coherence. Um, but as you see, everything goes out from and back to the hub. So over time, that becomes somewhat limiting. Um, I've certainly worked with networks that, where there has been a central convener that has kind of perpetuated this centralization while saying they want to do something else. And so our work has been to say, how do we, how do we connect the periphery to itself? Which is what you begin to see a bit with the dense cluster or mesh network. Um, in this case, actually, there's no central hub whatsoever. This is more like a peer-to-peer -peer network or learning network. And so with this dense cluster or mesh, you have people robustly connected to one another, um, but it too can have its limitations in terms of having some kind of central, central coordinating body, um, which is what you begin to see in a distributed or multi-tier network. Where you have some centrality, but also some distribution. So thinking about structure and what you have as a structure in your network versus what your intent is 
can be another way of thinking about how to create greater value and how to create greater impact, sort of aligning structure with your intentions. And this can be done through various kinds of, of network mapping, um, which we can say more about later. A third way to think about how to leverage um, impact, create greater value, is to understand that there are different kinds of roles and functions that support a network. And again, depending on the ki kind of network you're, you're trying to create, certain ones of these functions may be more important than others. So one of those is convening, which I talked about with respect to structure. At a certain time and place, it's helpful to bring organizations, individuals, the community together so it can talk to itself, begin to connect. So convening is a, is a, is a key and core function. Who is doing the convening? Are they trusted? With whom do they have relationships? Good strategic questions to ask around convening. Coordination is another key function. Coordinating logistics, coordinating communication, coordinating resource flows. Depending again on the kind of network you've got, asking yourself who is filling the coordination function to get things moving and organized. Facilitation is another key role and function, especially as you're trying to move from connectivity more to an alignment network. The art, the science of facilitation to get people to not just explore what they have in common, but to say, we agree, we align uh, around some kind, of, some kind of end. Along with that comes design, because we know that facilitation depends on good design, and, and design is both a process, a meeting, uh, an ongoing process for a network over time, but design also pertains to structure. What are the structures we need to put in place to facilitate the kinds of activity we want to see happen in our network? Communications and curation is another key function. Who's there to ensure that people have access to each other, can find one another, who's facilitating communication flows, information sharing, and, and not just in a way of overwhelming people. That's where curation comes into play. The art of making information both more accessible, attractive, manageable. Um, so curation becomes a very key function in networks. And last but not least, weaving. Because the basis of networks, again, are those connections. And so who are the weavers in your network? who are doing some combination of bonding, which means getting people in some kind of light group more tightly connected, but also doing bridging kinds of activity where you are reaching out beyond a group that may feel fairly well bonded and like they have something in common to some of those unusual suspects. Um, and that can create new kinds of access. It can create innovation. So again, weaving being a, a, key, a key function. So I like to put these six at least in front of networks and say, which of these are you filling? Which of these aren't you? Where are you strong? Where aren't you? And how does this align with what it is you're trying to create? To say just a little bit more about that last uh, function of weaving, um, which I can't, I can't emphasize how important this is and how in networks that I see that are strong and robust, you've got these incredible weavers. Um, I can think of the people <laughs> right now, see their faces who do this just so well. Um, and so what they seem to know intuitively, or, they've been, or maybe they've been taught it, is that network weaving is different than networking, right? So when we network at a conference, we're often going out and handing out cards and getting more people connected to us, which is good, can be good for us. Network weavers create connections by closing triangles. So they're going out and finding a couple people who should know each other and connecting them. And so you're creating this kind of, this, this triangle. And as you create these multiple triangles in a network, that's where you're starting to create that intricacy. You're not creating a bottleneck by making yourself the center. You're putting more people at the center so they can find one another. So, so making those connections, weaving is, is key. But again, those connections are only as good as what's filling them. And so feeding those connections as weavers, making offers, um, generous offers of excess capacity, um, of resources, of knowledge is key. 
uh, to ensure these networks can live up to some kind of promise. And you can also activate networks, not just by making offers, but by making requests. Uh, I've supported a few networks have, that have created this ritual of not just speaking at one another, but asking, drawing people out, asking questions, asking for support, asking for suggestions. And as you've probably seen sometimes on social media, when somebody asks a question, it can bring a network to life uh, in pretty interesting ways. So this is still um, thinking about those roles and functions that can support a network to be diverse and intricate and robust to leverage those network effects. Just a couple more and then we'll pause for any questions. Um, there's another um, key aspect of bringing these networks to life, which is just to think about network engagement and to understand that you're rarely going to have a network where everybody is engaged at the same degree of intensity. Um, that may change over time, um, but you're more likely to have people who are very, very engaged, you know, just a, a few of those. Um, and then uh, those who are kind of coming down this ladder of engagement, they're contributing in other ways. Uh, they may be mentoring, they may be recruiting people into the network, they, they may be attending events here and there, they may be reading, at least staying in the loop. Um, but ideally, everybody in your network is moving beyond this first rung of not listening, not paying attention, uh, if you want them engaged. And so having this notion of different levels of engagement can be a helpful guide, along with thinking about what weaving looks like if you're trying to bring people up the ladder, uh, whether you're just trying to understand better those who are kind of lurkers on the periphery, what do they want, what do they need, what might they bring to the network, or to those who are kind of in these middle rungs. Begin to knit people together um, invite them into contributing in different ways, sharing their expertise, sharing their knowledge. Um, and then at these upper levels, invite them to actually co-organize, co co-lead, initiate something. Um, so this, this art of engagement in a network context can be another key way of leveraging networks for, for impact. Um, I'm trying to decide whether I can, yeah, let me do this, let me do this slide, one last one. Um, so this is a, an, another uh, slide that comes out of the work of Plastic and Taylor, their net gains paper they put out in 2006. And I, and I love this because this, I just see playing out in all these different networks that I and we support, that networks are kind of moving often between these poles of tension around who they think they are, how they should run themselves, and how they are adapting over time. Um, and there's no one right answer because networks are kind of consistently evolving. But it is safe to say that in terms of identity, that if a network becomes all about the individuals and their self-interest, then it's not gonna be delivering uh, the kind of promise that networks can typically deliver on. And if you're only about the network as a whole without thinking about individual self-interest, it's probably going to fall flat over time. The fact is you want to be able to serve individual and network interests without fragmenting or coalescing too much. Similarly with governance, you can tip over to just complete freedom where people are self-organizing, but there isn't a lot of coherence or trying to control the whole thing too much, um, which destroys autonomy. So thinking about where your network is along these poles in terms of governance and decision making can be helpful. As well as thinking about adaptation and these poles are just ongoing consistent change where it feels like there is no coherence and people forget who are we <laughs> um, and what really brings us together. Um, and then the other pole of continuity which is not opening itself to change. Of course we know that in these times change is a constant and so we do need to be adaptive. So thinking about how you maintain coherence and change without tipping too much into inertia or into chaos. Uh, I once heard a network scientist say that most really um, robust thriving networks are always just at the edge of chaos. They're just at the edge there um, uh, because they're, they're trying to stay dynamic, 
trying to keep flows moving um, and not becoming too staid, um, having new members move in uh, and the like. So the last, last consideration for thinking about how to leverage network effects and create value for members of a network goes back to the paper that went out to you all. Um, and this list has been evolving as I continued to do my work over time and my colleagues as well, that there's nothing that really substitutes. I mean, you can have all these structures in place and these roles in place, but there's a kind of a core ethic and a way of being and a way of showing up um, that really facilitates greater value, generosity, abundance in a network. Um, so you've read about these. I won't go through them in tremendous detail, um, but just to say again, networks thrive and there's a, a spirit of generosity as opposed to waiting for the, somebody else to move if everybody's doing that there's no abundance uh when you've got the intricacy and in flow and, and people are not creating bottlenecks or hoarding resources when you avoid getting stuck in the core and remember that it's out on the periphery um, that you where a network is often most dynamic and so um, look to the periphery for that dynamism Certainly to try and break out of silos and isolation. Um, I love this one, and I didn't make it up. Somebody else did. But this idea of in networks, it's about contribution before credentials. There's some great stories about networks. I remember the Packard Foundation did a nitrogen, uh, sort of open source nitrogen research um, call. For what, you know, what are people learning about nitrogen pollution? This goes back several years. And one of the most valued contributions came from a 16-year-old homeschooled student in Oregon. It's a great example, right? No college degree there, it, but it was the value of the contribution that mattered. Um, not looking for your rock stars, creating more resilience and redundancy, so you're spreading out capacity. Um, embracing this ethic of, of self-organization, trusting your people, not having to grant permission for every step, and remembering that it's emergence that's partly the, the magic of networks, when things spontaneously emerge that you couldn't predict. Don't just look for the predictable and controlled. And then certainly to realize that in a network context, and probably in any context these days, Leadership is very much shared. It looks different, it's multifaceted, and it's multifunctional. So stop asking who's the leader. We're all the leaders. We may need to get clear on our roles, but we need shared, distributed leadership to make networks work. The two um, principles I did not include in that paper, uh, one, uh, which is one that keeps coming up in the work that I've been doing recently with networks, is reminding people that as things get complex in ecosystems, species actually hone in on finer niches and then connect more robustly with the rest. And so that seems to definitely be a call in these times that organizations are, are being asked to do what they do best and connect with the rest, not try and do everything. Uh, and then lastly, to lead with the spirit of love, coming back to that earlier slide about uh, our collaboration framework at ISC. Again, love for us is not sentimental, it is not superficial, it's fierce, it's deep, it's what takes us to the places of being able to have um, real conversations, real talk with one another, talk about what's really going on in terms of inequity, in terms of power, and to do that while holding one another's dignity in mind. This is not about shaming and blaming. This is about getting us all to a better place. So that love ethic, as Bell Hooks once called it, in place in networks can lead to considerable thriving. So I realize that's a lot, and uh, we're about eight minutes shy of the top of the hour. So I wanted to, again, see if there are any questions or comments, extensions, pushback, Clarifications anybody has? Raise your hands. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Curtis. I don't even know where to start. Um, I've received actually three or four questions on my end. So Great. I think I'll already ask you, and then other people can unmute um, as they feel inspired. 
So one of the questions, I, may, I might go through all of them just in the interest of time, and then you can respond right. sort of generally. Can you ask Curtis if that pyramid is a sequence that networks have to evolve to reach coordinate actions, coordinated actions? By his example, I had this impression. And is yeah, it possible? Okay, go. No. Oh, sorry. No, no, you said you were going to do them all. Go ahead. Yes. So is it possible for a network to work well without mastering all the key actions mentioned? And what exactly do you mean by excess capacity? Mm -hmm. Can he give an, uh, effective examples of understanding people not listening to the network? Would that be an ideal percentage of members in each category of engagement? Those are great questions. So um, I often get the question about the sequencing on this diagram. And it's not meant to be linear. Um, but what I would say and what network science would say and fellow practitioners is that if you do not have sufficient connectivity at your foundation, it's going to limit your ability to do other things. So I've actually worked with a number of networks which were kind of called together around a call to action, right? Something was happening around the policy um, and people were called to respond quickly through urgency. Um, and then realized, hey, you know, we kind of need each other. Uh, and there's no, you know, continued call for action just yet, but why don't we come back down here and get to know one another better? What else are we working on? Um, and so it's, it's, it, it's so I think Plastic and Taylor call these network types. I like to call them network modalities because you can kind of move between them. But again, I, I often find that coordinated action is, and, and alignment is only going to be as good as the connectivity that you have. And so you know, to get in that question about can a network do one thing better than another, absolutely, absolutely. And there's certain networks I've worked with that have said, well, we keep thinking we should get to action, we should get to action. Um, and there's no should, right? Sometimes networks just need to hang out at one of these, uh, you know, lower, lower, I don't mean lower in terms of um, less than, um, especially if there are others that do that coordinated thing out there better than you do. So I've worked actually with a couple of networks that have created hybrid networks where one subset of the network is just about learning and then another subset of it, subset of it is about action, especially when you've got, at least in the American context, those that you know, can't really do advocacy and others that are more oriented that way, um, so creating those kind of hybrid structures. Um, the question about excess capacity is just, you know, if we were to look uh, within ourselves as individuals or within our organizations, there's always something that we have in excess, um, a certain kind of knowledge or expertise that we could share with others. Um, and so a few instances have done that with networks where we just kind of surveyed, what do you have that's just kind of latent potential that you're not doing anything with that you might share with others? Um, and so that could be a, a, a resource of some kind. Um, you know, it's what's led in certain instances to nonprofits uh, in a given vicinity actually sharing a common resource because somebody realized we actually don't use this photocopier all the time, um, or sharing a certain role or function more broadly. So it's just thinking about what we have as under tapped capacity that we could share with others um, that can create that real. Um, glue for the network. Um, and I think I missed the last one, Sarah. Um, I'll reread it and also a few more that are coming in. People are yeah. typing to me. Um, yeah. Can you give examples of understanding people not listening to the network? What would be an ideal percentage of memory, uh, members in each category of engagement? How do you recognize yep. what your network does best? Um, what are some concrete examples of working with love in a network? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great. Um, so not listening, I mean, there are certain networks uh, that reach a certain point where, well, you could, you could begin, um, let me see, in terms of not listening, there are certain networks that I'm working with right now where some participants begin to kind of fade. <laughs> they fade out and it's clear that they're not tuning in anymore. They're not responding to emails. They're not showing up at meetings. They're not participating in work groups. Um, they just seem to be tuned out. And sometimes that's just what needs to happen. 
you know, and there are these cycles cycling on and cycling off. Sometimes that's problematic because they are members in some sense, and uh, there are certain expectations for participation, uh, and they're not they're not they're not up to date on what's going on. Um, so those are examples of not listing, listening or not enlisting. Um, in terms of the perfect balance, it, it really depends on the kind of network you have, its overall size. Um, I don't know scientifically whether the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, play, you know, applies here, but you're generally going to have many fewer at that organizing and committee, committing level, um, maybe a few more at the contributing and participating, and then, you know, probably more robust at the observing level. And that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. The periphery does not mean dis, it does not mean that there's unhelpful disengagement sometimes. Sometimes organizations have other priorities, but they can also become bridgers to, to other networks. Um, the question about love uh, is a great one. I actually gave a talk in Denver two months ago, this interactive session about what does it mean to bring love into networks. Um, just a few examples I would say is especially networks that I've been working with that are in this American context centered on uh, racial justice. Uh, a, a love has been about really getting to know each other deeply, um, engaging in storytelling, um, and engaging in kind of a, a deeper relational work. Um, uh, there's a there's kind of a, a actually a science of creating greater interpersonal resonance that we embrace, especially where we know things are going to get uh, maybe a little bit funky as we get into these deeper conversations about what's going on in the system and inequity and injustice and people's roles in that. Um, but love is also embracing each other more holistically. Um, Alberto Maturana and uh, Chile once said that love is seeing the other as a legitimate other, so seeing their fundamental legitimacy. Uh, and also another definition of love I love, I love is um, embracing full complexity of one another. And so that means pulling not, you know, the full, the full, the full realm of expression, uh, not just our intellect, our hearts, our souls. Um, anyway, more detail. I can send a follow-up um, blog post that I wrote about this. Um, but this is this is clearly a call on you times. We need we need more love, uh, that kind of fierce love. Uh, it seems I'm missing maybe Sarah a question. I know we're at the hour. We are at the hour. I might um, open it up just in case anyone wants to unmute themselves and say anything. I'll give ten seconds. <laughs> Great. I have um, one last question, I guess, um, Curtis, is um, a few people said that this was a lot of content um, that you've you presented and excellent content. And if you might be um, available in the future to talk about this um, to an extent, of course. So that is a that would be the last question, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. Um... And I will say that I'm in the midst of, of taking this content. I realize it is a lot, um, but I also find that people are coming from different places uh, with respect to this. And so hopefully there was something in here that spoke to where you are and you're thinking about networks. But the intent is to actually create a, a training around this so that it will be more opportunity to go into uh, all these different domains. Um, and yes, definitely happy to, to, to follow up and talk more about how this uh, applies to your work. Um, and, and I guess the, the last thing I'll say uh, on my end is just, you know, to come back to that, that notion of life and networks and um, there being life in networks. I often like to say to people that, you know, don't let the science uh, overwhelm, you, overwhelm you because we know networks um, intimately, right? It's all about human touch, human connection. Um, and so when we make room for that kind of humanity and that authenticity, we're doing that work. Um, so it's deep in some ways, but not so deep in others.
Thank you so much for this presentation, Curtis. I think it was very complimentary to the Jamaica meeting that we had for philanthropy networks and associations. You really gave us some new ways to think about doing network things, how we have to be adaptive, and how we can be more strategic and purposeful in our network building. Um, we'll follow up with this webinar by sending, sending you the recordings and also some of the resources that Curtis spoke about. And then more generally, um, we are working on a toolkit for philanthropy networks. So if you would like to be involved in that process, please reach out to me and we can make sure to include you on the task force for that. So thank you everyone for coming today. Thank you, Curtis, for your presentation and we'll be in contact with you.